recording this. We've recorded every one of them. Tonight is our 61st speaker. We've had more than that events, but this is our 61st speaker. We have them all on DVD, which is really an amazing amount of history that we've collected. And we started collecting that history in 2007. The museum this year celebrates its 10 years of being open. And we could not do that without all of you here. How many have never been in the museum? If you'll raise your hands. Just a few. Y'all need to come back more often. Uh, <laughs> we won't embarrass you. Um, in the event of a major disaster or fire, those doors are open. So shove that way. Um, hopefully nothing like that will happen. That will just take you right out to the alley. Um, but I do have to tell you about it. Like I said, we do have all of our speakers on DVD and I'd like to thank Phil for doing that for us. He's videoed every one of them. He's not missed a one. And uh, I don't know what we'd do without Phil coming and reporting these for us. Um, for those, I'm going to just give a little bit of history about the museum. Like I said, the museum, uh, we started these events in 2007, 2008. We opened the doors. When we opened the doors, we just had just a little bit uh, up front. And so everything that you see, including the building next door, is paid for. We don't owe anybody. We, we do work as we get money. And hopefully one day, we, we own the building next door. Hopefully one day we'll be able to uh, make the museum twice the size it is today. And believe me, we need three times the size it is today. We've got a lot of history to tell. Uh, and we just, every day there's, there's new things that come. Uh, about three weeks ago, a original Ben Earl Looney was donated by uh, the um, Hand family, and it's a it's a angle of Minden I've never seen. As you walk out, you'll see it. It's it's the old Hitchin lot, and it's it's a different angle of the courthouse. And it was probably painted. John A. Gann and I figured out that this was probably painted before Looney left Minden, so probably in the 30s or 40s is when this was painted. And the Hans family had had it all these years. Uh, but anyway, every, and we just got a 1925 Green Grig uh, last year, I mean uh, last week. Uh, so uh, we have a 22 or 23, but this is a 25. So if you have yearbooks from anywhere in Webster Parish that you'd like to donate, uh, don't throw them out. Bring them up here. Don't throw anything out. <laughs> <laughs> bring it, bring it, call me first and let's see if we want it. Uh, so don't, don't throw things away. Our uh, next speaker, which we have one more in May, and then we break for the summer. And then in September is when we have our big fundraiser gala. And I really, really hope all of you will come back for that. Uh, it's a very nice event, solid auction, have some wonderful food. Uh, just, a, just a fun night of helping the museum and it's our it's our main fundraiser for the year so we really really need you to support that if you can also over here on the table you'll see a basket if you pick up one of those envelopes and just look at it uh, we take anywhere from a dollar to a million dollars we don't uh, discriminate on the amount you know and, and every penny is appreciated every penny is appreciated we're very frugal, as you can tell by the air conditioner not coming on. <laughs> I'm going to work on that in a minute. Uh, next month, um, I know a lot of y'all uh, that graduated in the 50s, uh, graduated with uh, uh, Jenny Moreland Cannon, and uh, she's going to be here, and Jackie Moreland's brother is going to be here, and their uh, Jenny's daughter is also going to be here. So they're going to be talking about Jackie Moreland and his uh, success with basketball and his life. So that's going to be a really, really good one that you do not want to miss. And if you're on our mailing list, uh, you'll be getting a card. If you're not, join our Facebook group and page. You'll get invites to all of our events. Uh, but uh, can y'all think of anything I forgot? Board members? All of my board that's here, would you raise your hands? 
I want y'all to see this distinguished board that we have. <laughs> These are some hard-working folks. And, uh, and, and every now and then we'll let one off board, Carlton. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, the museum's, the museum's done a lot, and it was, it's Thad Anderson's dream that we have an established museum, and I, I like to think that we accomplished what Thad intended. Uh, and so I know he would be happy with this uh, large group that we have tonight, for sure. And I thank Anita for coming uh, tonight. But I'm going to introduce our speaker, and I, every one of you know who she is, so she really doesn't even need an introduction. But she's going to do a little talk about uh, going to Turner's boarding house and growing up and, and what it was like. So I'd like to introduce Ms. Harold Turner Thompson. Harold Lynn Corlews, we'll say. <laughs> My name was actually Harolyn. It was Harolyn. It was H A. I didn't have a name. I'm going to try to give you some of the background on the two boarding houses. Have to do, give you a little background on Turner's because they were a weird group. I'm kin to all of them, as you can tell. But uh, the Turners confused things, and I don't think they did it on purpose. <laughs> now, you know, I have a degree in biology. Red hair is a recessive gene, but the Turners have red hair in every generation. I even have a letter from a lady in Lubbock, Texas, she was trying to do her husband's genealogy. He's a Turner. And the first line in the letter is, are there any red-headed Turners? <laughs> <laughs> Lady, you just don't know. <laughs> the Turners also confused matters by doing what they did in those days. If a child died and the next child that was born was the same sex, they gave them the same name if it was a boy. Usually on the girls, they would add an initial, but nobody ever knew the middle initial. <laughs> so, and also, they named the children after their brother's children, and their brother's children named theirs after the other brother's children. <laughs> so we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> Now, we're not Miss Clovis, Miss Watson, Miss Grace Turner Watson, and Kay Pruitt and I have worked many, many hours trying to get the link back. And we can't do it. We get stalled in one place there because there are too many Meshachs and there are too many Shadrachs. <laughs> there was an Abandigo, and he lived here in Minden, and he was a mayor in Minden many years ago, but his name had been changed to Abner. <laughs> they changed from Abengo to A.B. to Abner, and that was Abner Turner who lived on Broadway up there. Um, actually, I could say I'm my own grandma, you know, like an old song, because we're kin to so many people. All of the relatives on both my dad and mom's side came here between 1690 and 1730. Now, they didn't come to Webster, well, it was Claven Parish, until the 1830s and 1840s. But as a result, they married cousins, and cousins married cousins, so maybe that explains something. <laughs> <laughs> but the main one I wanted to talk about was William Turner, who was married to Susan Black. And Martha's not here, and that was the main reason I wanted to tell her. She can go in DAR if she wants to on the black family there. But they had, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven children. John, don't know what happened to him. My father-in-law swore till the day he died that that was his great-great-grandfather. He had, his great-great-grandfather was John Turner, 
lived in Arkansas, where John disappeared from the scene. The rest of these started in Virginia, then came the route down like they did through Georgia, North Carolina, Georgia, on into Cleveland Parish, as it was known then. Polina was Martha Belton's great-great-grandmother. Robert Thomas was George Turner's great-great-grandfather. Cornelius was my great-great-great-grandfather. Nathaniel, we think he was killed in the Civil War, don't know. Uh, William was, uh, they married a Brantley, as did my great-great-grandfather. Dan and Elizabeth were twins, don't know what happened to them. But as a result of those, these are some of the families. Cornelius was my family. Cornelius had Nathaniel Barnett, and that was my great-great-grandfather, who married in the Strickland family and the Youngblood family. Then there was Susan Elizabeth, that's the Bailey family, and that's all the Baileys in Cal We have found, um, I have a book over here, and almost every one of the Baileys is in that book. Amanda married S.W. Jones, and if any of you remember Spencer Owens, that was his great-great-grandmother. Ophelia married Asa Woodard, that's all of the Woodards there. Benjamin married Georgia Beck, so we have all the Becks. Jackson Lee didn't make it. Mary made, married Charlie Beck, and that's why. I'm my own friend all there. <laughs> but now I want to tell you about the two boarding houses. And uh, John Campbell, I think, lives in one of them. <laughs> and that's the original. We, when you got your card, if you noticed on it, that was only one story. <laughs> because that was the way it was built originally. My grandmother and grandfather moved here. Well, they were both raised in Claiborne Parish, went to school in Webster, in Claiborne Parish. My grandmother went to school in Ravel for a couple of years after her mother died. But they were lifelong citizens here except for about four years. Uh, Granddad graduated from Tech in 1904. His diploma says accounting and handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't inherit <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. And by the way, interrupt me or if you ask, have a question, I don't mind at all. And if I stretch the truth, sorry. <laughs> My sister is no longer with us. She would be here correcting me. And I remember that too well. <laughs> but anyway, Granddad had the Railroad Express Company. And I know that uh, in one of John Agan's book, it shows him as a messenger for Western Union. Uh-uh, he was with the, uh, and that's not John's fault. It, the picture came out of the LSU archives, and it's wrong. He was with the Railroad Express and stayed with him until he died. He also was a fireman. He was fire chief here. And, of course, 1933, some of you heard about what happened those years, that we had a fire on one end, a tornado on the other end, and it busted in the middle because that was the year the banks went bad. And, unfortunately, Granddad's brother was either president or vice president of the bank, so there went any money he had, too, because he had convinced him he had to put his money in his bank. Uh, fire, for some reason, comes about in the family. The William Turner I had told you about earlier was killed in fighting a Rush Arbor fire in Georgia. His widow remained with the children, ran a 2,000 acre farm up there until she died. And how she controlled all of those turners, I don't know, but she did. But anyway, they moved and they lived in Mississippi. Our granddad was with Railroad Express in Shreveport for a couple of years, then in Mississippi, and during that time they were building the house. Now Fort Avenue originally 
was almost all Turners and Martins. Now my grandmother was a Martin. And on one end of the street was Miss Lucille Perelman, some of you may remember, she died when she was 104, I believe it was. She still believed that there was main streets of Minden were one way. <laughs> her son had to take her car away from her and she <coughs> told him the mechanic wanted it and needed to work on it and he took the tires off of it and told her they couldn't find tires to fit it anymore. <laughs> That's the only way we could stop her from driving around there in the car. Uh, John, you may not know this. But there's a fortune under your house. <laughs> when this one right here was a baby, and Dad had the house then, he was convinced that Billy would crawl under there. And there's a well under there. That well is full of those blue and crystal and orange and brown jar, mason jars <laughs> all the way to the top. <laughs> now, how many of them are broken? I don't know. But I do know that they put them in there, filled well, and then put concrete over it to keep him from falling in it. I don't think you ever went under that house. <laughs> Not that I know of. I hope you did. I wouldn't tell me. <laughs> you wouldn't tell me if you did, did you? But anyway, we get to the point then that. Uh, Granddad is, had a heart attack during the fire that destroyed the part of Bendon, the 1933 fire. Well, Mommy didn't have any talents at that time. I mean, she had gone to school, to a girl's school, as I said, in Rabel, where she learned to embroidery, um, to cook, but she had no vocational talent there. Well, he was down for a year, and I assume somewhere after that year is after he died the next year, he had another heart attack, and I assume that that was when the building, the second floor was built. Um, I wasn't around, believe it or not, <laughs> not yet. I know I have <laughs> but. Uh, the house originally, as far as we can tell, was built in 1911. And what I'm going by is Bertie Perriman's, the one on the end, she inherited it and it was built in 1913. The one by Billie Jean that is no longer there was built uh, about the same time and it was a Martin house, the town house, but it was destroyed there. And I did find a date when the second floor was added on to your house. 22, okay. Um, find out some interesting things there from that. Now, at this time, Ma Turner, she was then called then, was a widow. She had children and a grandchild, Uncle Bill. She had she had had four boys, two of them did not live past six years old. The other two were my dad and Uncle B.F. And they were probably as different as black is from white. <laughs> Nothing, anything alike. Uncle B.F. married early, had a young son, divorced, and then mommy kept dormant. She became her son, the you know, one he took care of. Uncle Biff later married Aunt Grace, and I don't know how many of you remember Grace Turner. You know what a <laughs> dominating, uh, indomitable person she is. She sneaked out of, her dad was a minister now, remember that? He was an itinerant minister. She sneaked out of the house to marry my uncle. They ran off and went to Washington, Arkansas, and got married. <laughs> and it's when she told me that, I didn't know that until later years. And that was hard for me to believe. But, I, you know, I imagined her having a church wedding with that organ, somebody playing the organ other than her. But it wasn't. She sneaked out the window instead. But anyway, 
The first boarding house, as I call it, was out of necessity. Mommy had to have make some money to take care of people, and her parents were dead. So that was why the first boarding house was formed. If you remember or have read in history something there, in the latter part of the 1930s is when we started having oil rooms <coughs> in Hainesville and some of the surrounding areas there. Well, a lot of those men needed places to stay. And that was the first influx of uh, boarders came in. The second happened because the shell plant. Menden went from 5,000 people approximately to 15,000 just about overnight. Anybody that had a room to rent did. Uh, we at the time had been living in uh, Haynesburg. Um, and this was, <coughs> I'll show you this. My dad started off in food from the very beginning. Uh, this was service grocery that was on Main Street. And if you get a chance, look at the prices on this. Ooh, you'd love to go to the grocery store now <laughs> with that. And you also could win a free wagon full of groceries. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Dad and Walter McCoy and Walter White all owned that. But well, Dad was 19 years old at the time. He and Mother married. Granddad had died. They moved to Hainesville, where Dad became a butcher at Reader's Grocery. We stayed in Hainesville four years, three years, went through three tornadoes. The first one picked the roof up off of our house and turned it around. The second one picked the roof up and put it in the front yard. The third one we packed and moved to home. <laughs> we stayed there a couple of years. And that's the only time I really got in some serious trouble Luckily, my best friend, we were four years old, four, between four and five, went to kindergarten there in Homer. Her dad was the sheriff. And it was a good thing because they were starting maneuvers and the soldiers were coming through. Well, the girl next door was high school and she was gorgeous. And she was always out there on the tennis court playing tennis. Well, Peggy Brown and I got the right idea that we could sell her telephone number. <laughs> like I said, it was a good thing her dad was the sheriff he got us out of jail. But she got a lot of phone calls. <laughs> well, we then moved. Dad went to work at the shell plant on the fire department and as a cook. Our next, we lived in a duplex and it's where the Episcopal Church Family Life Center is now. It's where that duplex was. In fact, there's under that concrete, there's some jewelry that my sister threw in the fire one day. <laughs> and it's still, I, we never found it, so it's got to be under the concrete. But anyway, every room was now filled at the boarding house. A couple of years after, about three years after my grandfather died, my grandmother married his cousin, told you, his cousin, <laughs> Lonnie Ball. And Lonnie helped her with the boarding house until the war started. And at that point, he left and went to Hawaii and worked out there. But uh, there were some interesting things that went on. Every room was filled. The ones that came, went to work in the morning, others came in and slept in their beds, and those left. Oh, <laughs> there was no room in this town there. Uh, there were anywhere from two to three of those long tables in the whole dining room, was a ta table with the whole length of the dining room, and there were two of them. And those things were filled up every night. What amazed me is my grandmother and Lonnie, before he left to go to Hawaii to work, got up every morning, 
made biscuits, breakfast, fixed lunches for all the reporters. And then they went off to work, and whenever they came back, so we're on shift work, whenever they came back, she fed them again. They did their laundry for them. Um, she kind of did a lot of extra things for them. She would call their, some of them had their wives would come up and stay, and there were two bedrooms that were kept just for families there over the years. But anyway, she worked, worked hard, had, didn't have child labor laws, I guess, in Louisiana because I had big beans. <laughs> I'd go over it. I never lived in the boarding house, you know, and when Dad had it or when my grandmother had it, we lived on Louisville Road. So we would go over and Mother would help Mommy and I would either pick beans, tomatoes, or whatever was in the garden. And over here, I do have a license to have a cow in the city of Minden. And I have a picture of the cow. <laughs> <laughs> there were chickens. There, she raised her own chickens. That whole backyard, that's one. There was dirt, rich dirt back there. <laughs> um, never had, no, it was just that cow that was over in the next lot there. But everything was just about raised there. She did have Mr. Wise, bless his heart, would bring big slabs of meat every day. And of course, one of the things she was famous for was that roast beef that she would have. It fits in a pot this big. And it was a huge roast. I haven't seen that cut since then. But that was in there. I brought the coffee cups. There are two over there on the table. Those are from the boarding house, the original boarding house. There was always a pot of coffee on the stove, on that big old stove that was in the back. And that's probably where Menden's first coffee club came. Because you see, there were a lot of young bachelors there in the boarding house. One of them was Dr. Trout. And that is the time I got in trouble at Tech. <laughs> Dr. Trout had a number of girlfriends that would walk past the house and always found it convenient. Mommy had uh, coffee and tea cakes every day at 4 o'clock. Miss Bogle always came across the street. All the gossip in town was known at that place. There were others, Miss Effie Turner, Dad's cousin, Miss Lola, the time I guess she had already gotten sick. I don't know. She was, I don't remember her ever coming. I went down and visited her, but all the ladies up and down the street would come. And all of these young unmarried teachers and other ladies would come by too. And there were some romances Mr. Hinton told me about in his because he was there when he met Miss Hinton. And there have been many others uh, that met their future husband there, my own sister did. So, but anyway, we had the coffee club every day. And it was, I don't know, it was convenient to know all of that stuff there. But anyway, Trout was, had come there as a young unmarried teacher. And he stayed there until he went into the Seabees during the war. He fed me my first turkey leg when I was six months old. <laughs> my mother never forgave it. <laughs> sick for a while. But anyway, when I went to Tech, by that time he had left Menden, had gotten his doctorate, and was teaching there, had met the love of his life, this wonderful lady at Tech, and married her. The first class I had was geography. And the first thing he told me, if you dare call me Trout, <laughs> I would get kicked out. <laughs> I didn't do it one time, and I said, please, please, please. But they were, it was just something. Also, and this was what was fascinating to a lot of other younger young ladies, with the Redbirds often ate up there. Now, the teachers ate there. I couldn't get away with anything. 
because they would come and tell my grandmother before I could even get in from school and go home and tell mother what I'd done or dad what I'd done. But the red birds during the summer, uh, Mr. Hunter would bring them up there to eat. The American Legion team, he brought them up there to eat. And Toe Shelley was going to tell this of her father-in-law, Charlie Francis was mommy's pet. And she would sneak extra food to him, extra cookies to him. He could do no wrong. <laughs> we tried. <coughs> he couldn't do any wrong. She loved him to death there. I've got to tell you about one unusual thing. You know, I said they had chickens. I don't like snakes. I don't like rats. But Richard Baker lived at, Dr. Baker had built the house next door. You know, I said they were all Turners and Martins. Well, then Doc built next door. And Richard stayed over there a lot, with me, especially with my step-grandfather. They went fishing and hunting together a lot. But anyway, our job at night was to go to the chicken house out there and kill any snakes and any rats or mice or whatever that was out there so that when Mommy went out the next morning to get eggs, it wouldn't be there. I held the flight <laughs> until I'd see a snake and then he was on his own. <laughs> but that wasn't in my job description. The only thing in my job description was the picking of beans there. Um, the food, it was boarding house style. You helped yourself. You could eat as much as you wanted to. And of course, most of them were so tired from working that they ate and went straight to bed. Mommy had very strict rules. No ladies were allowed upstairs. <laughs> the only ones that could go upstairs were the two maids. And they only went during the morning time there. She also, you paid on time. After all, $10 a week for room and board and lunches and extra. She didn't think that was too much. She kept that price through 1960-something. Mm -hmm. And before she, and of course she actually, the last day she lived, she got up, fixed breakfast, fixed the lunches, went to Shreveport to have surgery, and didn't make it through the surgery. Mm -hmm. So they, that was the end of the first morning. Now the second one comes about, now our next door neighbors, when we lived on Lewisburg Street, was Wimpy Lunsford and his wife. Now Wimpy and Dad went to the fire department, they both worked there, both worked as cooks. Dad later became personnel manager, but Wimpy stayed as a cook. But later, they went in business against each other. Dad had the southern kitchen. Wimpy had the downtown. But you know what? They shared their recipes and all of that. There was nothing that they didn't share. And they weren't really rivals. They would tend to be. But mother and his wife and all of them were just two good friends there on that. But Dad and was in partnership with Johnny David and Dad started having some health problems. So he sold his part of the Southern Kitchen. We had people coming in all the time after that. Where is Happy? Where is Happy? By the way, he was named, nicknamed Happy the day he was born. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know his real name for years. <laughs> Nobody else did. Somebody said Harold Turner. They thought there was another Harold Turner in town, and they thought that's who you were talking about because no one ever knew anything but Happy Turner there. But anyway, Dad decided that he was getting tired, and so he sold his part, but he didn't want to retire. So what did he do? My grandfather had been there had come back and had been working there, um, but he didn't have the boarding house. He just 
had a board or one or two there. So he moved into his house that he owned. And Dad decided, I'm going to have a boarding house again. I'm only going to have one meal a day, five days a week. Now, my grandmother was open every day. And she also took in, I think she had a mark on the door because every hobo person down on their luck, anything, came by and she fed them. No matter what, she fed them. And she also fed, I don't know, I know y'all remember Miss Anna Smith. That was the first time I remember learning what a wonderful lady she was instead of the lady I was scared to death of. <laughs> she was as tall and we were all, Hennigan especially. <laughs> she gave him fits, but we were all scared to death of her. She didn't have any family. And my grandmother would make sure that Christmas and Thanksgiving she came and ate with us at the boarding house. And we ate every Sunday dinner there. Now, she'd get up, cook dinner. She didn't know Lee, Marie, they'd cook. Then Mommy would go to Sunday school, but then she usually skipped church and came back. And it was on the table when we got back. And there was no telling. They'd be anywhere from our families to 15 extra people or more. Anybody she saw makes me think of a certain son-in-law back there. <laughs> and by the way, this is my daughter and my son-in-law there, and this is my one of my sons and his wife and my sweet grandchild there. So I'm happy they're here, plus some special friends from Spring Hill here. But anyway, we got so tickled for that. Um, Dad, after he opened the boarding house, now at the restaurant, and we always told him this, if he had patented his chicken, he was the first to serve fried chicken with honey. And if he had patented that chicken, the Colonel wouldn't have had a chance. <laughs> his bread is another thing. Do you know that he got a well, this was at the morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the other people that were there, um, Dad would get up every morning at the boarding house and make about 200 loaves of bread. Any bread that was left over, a mother made in <coughs> monkey bread which we would always go by and get that. Now, the routine at the boarding house was a little different under Dad. As I said, he didn't have borders. He just had the, well, there were one or two that were old-timers, as I said, that had, would come back. The show bands came to visit quite often. Uh, Dad and David Snell were really good friends, and when David would come in from his writings up in New York and all, he usually brought somebody with him to come to Turner's boarding house. But probably the main thing at Turner's boarding house, and I've already talked to some of you, and I know this, I was teaching at Minden High. I knew the ball players were sneaking off and going up there to eat. The coaches knew it too, and what they would do is they'd come to my room and say, are they back yet? Call your dad and see if they left. So we could go up there. <laughs> we had a few dads said that uh, got a little bit rambunctious with trying to eat all the chicken before anybody else could get there. One that was the worst about that is not here tonight. And I was hoping he was because he's a cousin. Now he's going to get on right there. Dad and his bread and his sausage. He, well, he tried to set them. He was a fireman, too. He was fireman for 50 years. He was always setting the smokehouse on fire. <laughs> so he had to be a fireman to protect himself. But Miss Mel Watkins Haynes lived around the corner from him. Dad started off trying to go by mommy's prices which was $2.25 for a meal. Now that was 
a lot less than he had at the Southern Kitchen. But he was going to try <coughs> to do that. Well, Miss Mel would send for two meals each day. And even over the years, even though Dad had increased, <coughs> she never gave you more than two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> no tip for bringing it to you. You have to take it to the house. No tip for that. <coughs> Some of you remember Mr. A.Q. Hackett. <laughs> Dad got sick. Well, I was the most popular teacher in the school one day a year, my birthday because dad would come up there with those pound cakes and it would be hot and the teachers would be waiting on them. <laughs> if he didn't get that, when's he coming, when's he coming? Well, that was his deal that he loved to make those pound cakes and take them out to everybody in the community that had a birthday. I don't know how many cakes he made. I just know there were a number of them. Well, dad was in the hospital with pneumonia. Mr. A.Q. called the house, and I happened to be there. He said, where's my birthday cake? <laughs> Mr. Hackett, Dad's in the hospital. We're not sure if he's got pneumonia, had a heart attack, or what. Well, I want my cake. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know it, or didn't know it, I don't guess. No. I went out to the freezer and got one out, thawed it up, and took it to him. <laughs> Probably one of the funniest things that happened, and it was sad too, Dad had always told my sister and I that he was leaving us something special in the safe deposit box. Well, okay, what's it going to be? What, is it Lafitte's treasure? What, what is it, boy? What are we going to have there? I'll tell you in a minute what it was. But before that time, my sister and I jumped on Dad about so many drinkings, many Cokes. Dad, what are you doing with all those Cokes? And just laughed at me. There would be cases of Cokes there by the house. What, what are you doing with all those Cokes? Oh, I need one every afternoon or so. Well, we knew that he kind of had stomach problems, so he never ate at the house. Mother cooked for him when he came home, even from the restaurant. We didn't eat at the restaurant. That kind of worried me at times. So <laughs> I made up for it. I won't put it that way. <laughs> Cokes, that bothered us. We talked about it. We said, what do we need to do? Do we need to call the Coke company and limit him on the number of cases he can have? When Dad died and we opened the safe deposit box, there was his recipe for his bread. Guess what's in it? <laughs> that was the secret ingredient in his bread. And we have tried and tried to follow that recipe. I come close, but I hadn't gotten it yet. I think it's because he used a yeast cake and he used the old fashioned coke, a little six ounce bottle coke. But that was that. The day that Dad, we closed the boarding house for the second time. Mother was sick. <coughs> Dad had gone to pick up the maids. And he had what we suspected later. We were told he had a silent heart attack. We didn't know what was wrong. He had passed out by the fire station. They took him to the fire, to the hospital. Aunt Grace said, they already have the dinner started here. You and I can handle this. <laughs> and I called my principal and told him, explained to him, and he said, well, we'll be up here to eat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Aunt Grace was in, we always called her, Dr. Lott and I called her the general. She had been the general secretary when they were in service. And she still was good at directing things. So I thought she can handle this. She said, you go to the hospital and stay with your dad until you can talk to the doctor. I said, okay. I went and checked on mother, got her medicine for her, and went on back to the hospital. About 20 minutes later, I get this frantic phone call. I'm at dad's at the hospital. Dear, can you come? I can't handle this. <laughs> so, I went back, I put a sign on the door, closed until further notice, 
and we never opened the boarding house again for that. Dad continued to make bread, sausage, and pound cakes and take them to everybody that was in the town there. And that is my boarding house part, but I do have some things I can tell you about some school kids. <laughs> <laughs> he really was one of my favorites there, but he and Jerome Vasicki did give me problems, didn't you, dear? Say so, yes. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, those two were the only two in all my years of teaching that made me cry. <laughs> I never knew what was going to happen in that physics classroom next. I walk in one day and here's this thing down the whole aisle there, rally champs. That Iger was, Sox, I think they were rally champs. Right. We had, you had your tiger socks on and rally champs. And that was, we had fun with that. And I had one on pro throw I was going to tell me. He was mean to me. <laughs> I was, it was the year of the... I'm going to tell him. You know what you did the first time. Well, there were about four times. Here I was. We were trying to win state championship. I was having to teach past the allotted time because you were supposed to quit at three months, and I was still up there because Coach Dart, uh, Coach Kelly couldn't. He was teaching the other chemistry mm -hmm. class, and I had to teach. And what does that bozo do? He <laughs> comes down the hall every morning with a bag of fresh pop popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was going to get you back one of these days. Uh, Harold, I wanted to say that everybody referred to it as Happy Turner. Except me. What did you call it? I have always referred to it as the Mendon High School Cafeteria Extension. <laughs> <laughs> and you agree with me that y'all called him. Dad would, Dad would wait on the call. He knew that the coaches and the counselors and all the others were sneaking up there after the students had left. <laughs> No, and I've got one more story. A lot of may remember this and maybe not. It was the most embarrassing thing that happened to me in school. Coach Oliphant was my hero. I loved Coach Oliphant. Bessie Minnis and I taught swimming for him. She was good. Yeah. We were, were in the third grade. He had taught us to swim. And we were... You know, we would go and help him in the summer to teach the swimming classes. Well, they had started the opera game. All of them were seniors and juniors and sophomores in high school, big kids. And here's Bessie and I. We're at that time in the fifth grade, but neither one of us weighed more than what, 60 pounds at the most or something. Coach Alpha said we had to be there and be substitutes if anybody didn't show up. Well, he had this elaborate deal planned for this applique <coughs> that they were going to take a big, big tire and, um, <coughs> the inner tube on this end of the pool and on the other end there would be another one and that the swimmers would form a perfect diamond. Guess what? The one that was not there today was the one that I had the inner tube. They were supposed to be doing the inner tube. The other end was Misty's, and it was, she had to substitute. They weren't there. Well, these were two of the biggest guys in the school. They were the big football players. <coughs> that diamond was no diamond. <laughs> we, uh, we were swimming for our life, and I was in the deep end. Please, <laughs> Lord, just let me survive there. And when I started this, I told you I would 
welcome any questions. I don't know that I can answer them, but I would be happy to try. <coughs> Uh, John, you have done such a beautiful job with the house. Oh, it's a great place. Well, it's a it's wonderful a, place. I am sure there are ghosts that run there. Chicken. You can smell <laughs> the chicken when you're crying. You can still smell it, can when, you? When did Happy stop, stop serving lunch? When did he stop? Uh, it's going to be 60... Probably 70s. 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 You were 80. It was 80 something because when you were still in high school. Okay. Still serving. So it was in the 80s. I think. Yeah, they tried to teach. Over Lee and Marie tried to teach Cindy how to cook. Didn't work. But they, they let you sit on the lard cans. I mean, she was. <laughs> yeah, it was. Before you went to college? No, it was like 80, I want to say 81. 81, probably. Yeah, you know, because mother died. And it was right after that. But uh, any other questions? Carl and I could tell some others, but I'm not. Thank you. And I want to tell one that uh, Bill Hoot and I would occasionally go out at lunch to check people to find. You know, McDonald's and get those who were eating away. But Bill Hoops, I wait, said, don't go to Happy Turner's. <laughs> because he was afraid he'd find teachers there, too. <laughs> he would have. I can name names. I blackmailed them for years. <laughs> Any other questions? But that was the demise of the second boarding house. And by the way, I had talked to several people that had called this morning, different ones, and Teensy, my friend from college, and Shirley knows her too, she said, we didn't have a boarding house in Ravel. I said, well, just one big enough, I guess. <laughs> there were two in Megan. There was another one down close to the post office. But Mom, Ma Ball, Mom Turner's, and as Carlton said, Midland High School Cafeteria Extension. That was probably about right. And do you remember going to Camden, Arkansas? Mm -hmm. Or sending your students up there to see the light? Oh, I knew you were going to. <laughs> <laughs> At Crawford. I'm sorry. At Crawford. It was a Crawford. That rascal, we lived in Bastrop. And my husband was a forester for the CrossFit Company. And of course, when we moved over there, that was one of the first things she got to go see the light. She got to go see the light. And supposedly, the uh, engineer or someone's head was cut off, and they're looking for it, and they swing the light. Well, there is something there, but I kind of think it's the pine trees and the Luminescence from me. But I did pass by you and sing a very uh, That's what I was I fixing to tell. He <laughs> <laughs> would wait until y'all were in class and do that and come down the hall. Yeah, you did that. I was going to tell, but then I thought, oh no, that was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to tell the one about Andy, or do you want me to tell <laughs> Forgotten that one. That's the only time I've ever seen you lung busted, I guess is the word. You don't remember coming to our EH class and we were teaching, um, oh, so, what were we teaching? Mary Ann, what were we teaching? I don't know the story. Oh, you don't Remind know the story. Okay, the story. I had John and let's see, it was Andy. Gilbert. Andy Gilbert and John Montgomery, Edna Windsor, and Winky Newer in that the class. Was hard to <laughs> <laughs> and we were teaching about political things and terms and everything. And you asked Andy, do you remember what you asked him? You asked him what an innuendo was. <laughs> and what did he tell you? I forgot. <laughs> he told you it was an Italian suppository. He could not say a word. He 
How many how many years did Ovali and Marie work? Did they work for grandmother or did they work um, for this? Grandma <coughs> said work for mommy. Ovali worked for mommy. Uh, Marie came, she was Marie Rice, and she came a little later with Dad. But I kind of think, she, I don't remember how long she was there. She was there until the very end. I know with Dad. Was she there with Mommy, too? I don't remember. I don't think she was with uh, Marie, I mean, Ovali was. And there were others. Um, I had a good life in Mendes. It was a wonderful time. I can remember your mother telling us to go home from the tennis court. <laughs> she was in charge. <laughs> and she would tell us it was time to go home and we would all walk home. <laughs> because I always lived close enough by. It was a a wonderful time to teach, and I had some of the best students in the world, and I enjoyed every one of them there, and my classmates that I graduated with, and we've actually had class reunions, and we're still here. <laughs> but, uh, is there any other question? I was going to end with the Andy deal, because I... <laughs> <laughs> I reminded him of that in church one day. <laughs> Anyone else any questions? Where'd Shelly go? It's going to tell her. Well, Harold my son is going to absolutely kill me for telling this story. I said I was, I told my friends I'm not about to tell it. But here I am. But my oldest son, Steve, Mm -hmm. And young Carlton Proko, who is not like his father, <laughs> he is a saint. And Mark Woodard ran together. Oh, yes. Well, they were in high school on the football team. Mm -hmm. And they loved Turner's, mm -hmm. going to Turner's to eat. Well, one day, they all three came to my house after lunch. And I don't think it was Carlton now. I think it was Mark Wood because Carlton wouldn't say a word. But Mark Wood has said, tell your mama what happened at lunch. And I thought, oh, no. What, what happened, Steve? He said, well, Mother, I was hungry. And he, she, uh, Wooder said, tell her how many pieces of chicken you ate. I said, son. He said, well, Mother, I only ate 17. <laughs> he said, they were wings and legs. <laughs> and Woodard said, wait a minute, Steve. It was more like 25 minutes ago. <laughs> so he said, he is going to have to stay home next week and not go to Turner's yeah. for a week. Dad told him to go Also. Now, please don't anyone ever tell my oldest son. My <laughs> and that was for $3.25. Yeah, he went up, well, he went up to $5.50. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Had to. Had to. <laughs> there was one more thing. Uh, there is one, and it's in the, some of the papers up there. There's a recipe that my mother came up with, and it was an accident or a um, what had happened is we had had the usual crowd on Friday, because Dad had chicken livers and gizzards on Friday. And there were several businessmen in town that would come and dump the whole plate in their plate, or the whole bowl, because he just put it out in the bowl in front. Well, Mother had fixed fresh corn. She ran out of corn, didn't have much left, not enough. And she said, oh, there's another group coming in. So she decided to go and she made a new dish. She took hot tamales, a can of hot tamales, cut them up and put them in the corn that was left. It became the most requested. <laughs> 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 and as Billy and Cindy will tell you, Mother was bad about experimenting. Mm -hmm. And probably the story that they remember is one, she wasn't 
wasn't a very good cook sometimes. She could cook cakes like nobody's business, but regular things. But one day, she was fixing breakfast for Dad. The toast was toast. And Dad just looked at it and said, Hazel, I think you got it a little brown, didn't you? Black. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have some tails? <laughs> Do you have any? Are you going to print out these recipes for your family? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying now. I do have the, we found the uh, bread recipe. I do have it. Well, I've got the pound cake. You've got the pound cake. I've got all of the, some of the recipes, <laughs> like the peanut brittle that uh, Mommy made. She would send a box of a peanut brittle to Ruston once a week to Tech. There were five people in my mailbox that went in with me. I never got but one piece. <laughs> All the dentists in Minden loved her. <laughs> but yeah, that's something I'm trying to do now. Because Miss Tinsley must have. You need to do that. Okay. <laughs> I've lived next door since 84, and at least 10 years, I've directed people that, that know you can't eat over there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and people just passing through, go off the interstate, and kind of know the area, go, no, I'm sorry, it's not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I've had people trying to board. <laughs> cookies of uh, the tea cakes and the coffee. My grand step granddad usually made that coffee and it was usually so thick it probably could have dissolved a spoon. But people just kept, kept coming back for it. And that's why it's so amazing to me. I have five of those cups and they're all white. <laughs> it looked like they would have been stained so white. I never put them. But they're all <coughs> Yeah. I live on Southern Street, so I knew Mr. West when he had his lunch time and he never stopped at the stop sign and went to the door. <laughs> and then I knew Mr. Ferris, he was very generous with his eggs and, and ham and all that stuff. Oh, he kept Mr. Ferris. the same time of water and all the other time. Mr. And then Ed Turner lived across the road. Right. It was a whole Turner block. Miss Davis was lived Turner. on the end. Yeah, yeah. she was a Turner. Well, the whole block all the way around was Turner's. Was Turner's, and what when Turner's were the Martins, which were married into the Turner's. And our best friend in this event is Ferris. Yeah. Mr. Ferris. Mr. Ferris. Mr. Ferris. I was at the, uh, at the driver's license bureau when she showed up and she was married to Yeah. And they told her she couldn't have a license. And I had to back off because she let them know I've been driving them under the door. She had two pints of her. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you a good one on this period. You know, when her brother died and she was just about to go home, Mr. SF, Dr. SF Martin, he left her son a million dollars and left her half a million and she got mad she was a hundred <laughs> <laughs> he left all that to you what are you going to spend it on <laughs> she had a 49 Ford and when yeah. she started out of the driveway you give her plenty of her <laughs> <laughs> and if you saw her on Main Street you better go away didn't we have wonderful people and wonderful memories? And we still do. And I love the town of Minden. I live in Hadley, but I still always will be a Minden one. Name. And, uh, <laughs> and so uh, 
I would sell those excuses to those people coming back <laughs> from Turner's. And then Carlton caught me up there several times, but he said, just go ahead and eat and then head on back. <laughs> but I had, a, I had a real good sideline job there selling excuses. <laughs> But y'all do, y'all come back next month. Uh, that, that should be a real good program. And look at all the items here. We still got plenty of food and still got plenty to drink. Thank you for coming.